But who wants to take the floor? Uh, so may maybe we, we will turn around in that sense. Please. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There is a, um, a school of growing criticism of unconventional monetary policies. And personally, I'm agnostic because I feel like I lack all the tools to really make a determination for or against it. But do you have a view on it? And then are you concerned by the other part of the criticism, criticism which is that there's basically too much debt overall uh, you know, between governments, sovereign states, and, uh, and private players? We'll take a number of questions, of course, and then the speakers will respond. Thank you very much indeed. <coughs> Thank you. And, uh, so I, I, I thought this conversation was quite interesting in what it did not say or what was hidden in the conversation. I think I, I will not step in the inflation conversation. I think it's an important one, but I think there are even more important things behind inflation, as has been said by, by many. Uh, I think we are feeling the compounding impact or the compounding effects of traditional crisis, and we react with traditional tools and traditional reactions. With on top of that is geopolitical shift that we are considering, which basically makes these things a little bit more complex than 15 years ago when it was basically the Europe and the US discussing the future of finance. Now it's a little bit more complex, plus a required transition with climate. So that's a lot to swallow. And I don't think we've agreed on what is a policy mix nationally and internationally to address these compounding effects, and what is the social contract we want to discuss with people. And these are very striking questions that we have ahead of us, which are not just for the financial people to address, but I think it should be part of their, of their thinking. Uh, and then as part of this, to echo what, what Jan uh, just said, I think we are moving also, and it's been said by, by several from a period where leverage was the name of the game, and it was pretty easy. I mean, you could borrow at zero. It was very easy to buy real estate. It was very easy to do m and It was very easy to value uh, Tesla at whatever price. And now we are moving to a balance sheet stress where there is nowhere to hide because it's very unlikely that the central banks will step in the way they stepped up in in the past. So this is a complete change of the game. And I don't think we've started to really think what it means going forward. My third question, and it's related to the real economy. Uh, are we going to finally allocate capital properly? Meaning, do we have the risk pricing, and I'm, I'm turning to André, do we have the risk pricing mechanism that will properly allocate capital and properly price the risk and, and stop wasting money where it's not needed? Coming back to my point on, on, on the transition, etc., I think at a moment where there are more investments needed than ever, uh, and when there is uh, capital, it's probably not scarce, but it's risk adverse. So people will rush to buy U.S. Treasury instead of investing in things that are really necessary for the world and necessary to repair the social fabric that, that, that Pierre mentioned, some of the points that John made. So I, I think this question is central to me. Are we heading in the right direction or is it just a blip and we will face inflation and not address the core issue, which is are we allocating our scarce resources where they are needed for the next 20 or 30 years? I don't have the answer. And finally, now of course, because it's me, I, 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 I'm a little nervous with all the discussions on ESG. So the focus on environmental, social, and governance issue. And now that it's becoming really serious, that we realize that it's not just a nice transition where you reallocate one or two percent of your savings per annum, but it's way deeper. Uh, people are becoming nervous. So let's say in the, yeah, the Economist made this cover page this summer, ESG, these three letters will not save the world. Texas is giving green credit to BNP Paribas and BlackRock and say, we don't want to work with you because you're too green. And then California say, we don't want to work to you because, with you because you are not green enough. So uh, is it serious or is it another joke, uh, another tool of the financial industry to fool the people? I don't know, but there is growing doubt. So, Again, not totally uh, linked, but I wanted to share these four uh, messages. Thank you very much indeed. I'm not sure, frankly speaking, that we ever had a nice period where uh, you were tranquil and uh, everybody was tranquil and the central bank were tranquil. I have known permanent crisis, permanent period of crisis. And the worst recent crisis was the so-called very calm and tranquil and great moderation world, which ended with the worst crisis ever since World War II, which could have been the worst since World War I. So, so we, 
we are permanently in a dangerous world. Right. I, I never say, say tranquille, Jean-Claude. I, I agree that... No, no, uh, I never we, say tranquille. I, I agree I that the, the accumulation of threats <laughs> are there and uh, particularly demanding. And on top of that, with the geopolitical element that you mentioned, and we did not mention too much because <laughs> we, we all agree that it is a common factor, I guess. What, what you said on ESG is very important, and I expect that we will uh, all respond to that. Thank you very much. Madame, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur Trichet. Um, I have a question about inflation emerging markets like Turkey and Egypt. Um, there is a trade-off. I mean, you don't need to be an economist that higher, you know, to, to curb inflation, you need to raise interest rate. But Poor people, I mean, interest rate, low interest rate is basically a subsidy for everyone, especially the poor, because the poor live on credit. So how can we, in, for example, in, in Turkey or Egypt, how can we, how can we fight inflation without, without really creating, because if you want to raise interest rate, that will mainly affect the poor who live on credit. So how can you fight inflation without creating, creating unrest in this country? Thank you. Thank you. Good question <laughs> for uh, all of us. Thank you very much. You have the floor, madam. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jean-Claude. Um, um, I, uh, I will um, echo um, my friend um, Jan Lipsky's uh, remark about uh, the common framework and the importance of, of saving it for sovereign debt restructurings that are coming and they're looming. Um, you know, by an estimate, um, you know, between 35 and 60 countries will be in emerging markets, um, middle income and uh, low income countries will be in financial distress um, in the next two years. Um, so, you know, the, the common framework was introduced uh, in 2020 in November. Only three countries have applied, um, and it seems to be, um, you know, um, a, a logjam um, at the moment uh, with some uh, very, very small steps, um, uh, you know, progress. And one could say the problem seems to be China, but nobody knows the reasons, you know, po possible explanations. Of course, on the China side, that uh, you know, Chinese lenders don't want to crystallize losses, which is understandable. Their balance sheets uh, are already under pressure from the real estate collapse and uh, other uh, difficulties. Um, there is a lack of coordination among the various institutions in China that have done the lending. And um, they're simply inexperienced in sovereign debt uh, workouts, and uh, they're afraid that uh, the Western uh, lenders will take advantage of them. Um, and uh, the, the fifth reason could be that uh, you know, debt issues are part of a broader um, geopolitical situation. Um, you know, China might see no reason to cooperate on debt until they could extract some concessions elsewhere. But in truth, nobody knows. You know, it's, it's complicated. As John mentioned, you know, now, uh, China is rising, uh, well, has risen um, as, uh, as the third uh, major lender um, group um, in the sovereign debt workouts in addition to uh, Paris Club um, members and uh, private creditors. So, um, but, um, you know, common framework um, progress remains obstructed. Um, is it des destined to fail? Um, I think not. Um, an enormous amount of political capital has been invested by official creditor and now um, other stakeholders in the common framework. Um, they will not easily let it fail, um, I hope not, but how to break that logjam. So what is needed, I, I believe, is the credible way of assuring each creditor group, including um, non-Paris Club um, bilateral creditors such as China, India, and other non-Paris Club um, creditors, that once a restructuring agreement is reached with them, no other creditor group can later extract from um, the debtor country more favorable um, to the creditor um, treatment. So the best idea so far uh, that I've been uh, reviewing is uh, getting uh, traction um, among participants in Washington um, is a proposal to use the most favored um, creditor clause um, to deflate any expectations China or others might have um, by holding you know, out or holding hostage the process um, and uh, that would be able to extract better deals, uh, better deal once uh, the you know, deal with um, others was made. So it will 
have to be a cross-creditor um, group uh, most favored nation clause um, compared to um, comparability uh, treatment as a Paris Club um, principle, which is a variation of mo most favored creditor clause. And it will have some, you know, it will need to have some courage from, uh, uh, from debtor countries um, to propose it because that will be a unilateral proposal and others hopefully will, uh, will join. But it seems to be better than um, that the current logjam. And uh, so I want to also thank um, um, Hori san um, uh, because I, I was, you were sitting next to him on, uh, um, uh, three years ago in, in Marrakesh. I'm and sorry to predicted. interrupt you. Do you have a, a precise questions uh, yes, for no, the speakers? I, I, yes, uh, to John. For John in particular, uh, yes, perhaps. Yes, exactly, so. because uh, you um, no. Well, I'm actually continuing with John. Maybe I'm answering a question with John uh, that whether it will, um, you know, uh, the, the common framework will fail. I think, you know, it shouldn't fail. It won't fail. We'll, you know, it won't be let fail. But there has to be a solution. So, and, and uh, you know, saying that China, you know, I wonder whether John agrees um, whether China is the problem or it is the multi, you know, multilateral issue. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I, I think you, you have a very, very important point, of course. We, we have a real problem with China, to my knowledge, and mainly with China, even if there are other creditors, uh, potential creditors that are uh, at stake, of course. Thank you very, very much for this important question. Please. Thank you. Uh, well, I have a quick question to the panel about the future of the dollar as a reserve currency. Uh, I think last year we had had quite a few discussions on the, fa on the role of the dollar as a vehicle for the U.S. to enforce uh, the extraterritoriality of, of their sanctions. And um, what we've just read is that the uh, recent trip of uh, Xi Jinping to uh, the Gulf uh, ended in uh, deals which are going to be labeled in uh, yuans or whatever you call it, or revenue bees. Uh, and so I'd like to know how the panel views the uh, future of, uh, of the dollar as a reserve currency. A very important question, of course. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, who wants to take the floor? Please, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to build on what you said, Mr. Jacquet, on the question around a supply chain driven inflation. I think when we look at inflation today, it's driven by, um, I think, four major supply chains, energy, agri-foods, metals, and semiconductors. And so the question is, do central banks really have all the tools to tackle this supply chain disruption? Thank you very much. Please. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have raised one, one remark. I'm an entrepreneur, and I talk also with quite a few other, other entrepreneurs, and I'm also on the board of some manufacturing companies, middle-sized, but, but quite sizable manufacturing companies. And I think we have another factor. It's, I wouldn't call it supply chain shock, but it is the lack of skilled staff. And I think this is, a, this is a major problem, and this is exacerbated by the fact that we have to do a lot increasing administrative work through a very high level of regulations and reporting on that. And it has constantly things added. For instance, in Germany there are now two very heavy things added. This is this control of the supply chains, the ethical and uh, the control of the supply chains where there's a reporting and the sustainability reporting. It doesn't mean that, uh, that I think it should be misused, but, but it is a, a lot of ad additional work coming here. And I think that the uh, wage price spiral is already rolling. Uh, I know in all the companies where I'm involved, uh, there will be considerable uh, uh, rises in payment, uh, six, seven percent in this one. In certain countries, like for instance in Austria, we give not necessarily that we say we have a l less percentage rise, but they get a one-time payment to, uh, to balance up, which, which comes to, to the same. And in Germany, there was recent, I think last week, there was a conclusion of the largest trade union, the um, metal and electric union, 
where they decided on a, on a very high uh, price increase, a wage increase. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much indeed. I, I note en passant that it is not exactly the same to augment the regular wages and salaries because it's recurrent and to give a premium which is not recurrent and, of course, would be a good way to avoid this wage uh, price uh, spiraling. But thank you very, very much indeed. Bruno, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I would like to have your view on the future of the, de of the debt accumulated to, uh, to face the COVID crisis. I heard John mention the service of the debt is manageable but the ratio of debt to GDP is still uh, very high. And do you think we can uh, look at that with benign neglect uh, because it's on the balance sheet of the central banks and it's a sort of helicopter money? Or do you think it's a real issue for a financial risk? And in that respect, inflation, uh, the view is sometimes that inflation can be uh, useful to, to reduce the debt. Uh, how do you react to that? <laughs> Thank you very much, Bruno, indeed. I think that we, uh, no, we... Can I pick up the last questions from the audience and then we turn to the speakers, please? Um, <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to circle back to developing economies in a way. I mean, uh, twin deficit crises are looming large uh, with very tight fiscal space, especially given that uh, expenditures will be needed for climate change adaptation and mitigations. And at the same time, uh, my question mostly to, to, to Mr. Ecuy, actually, do you think that um, private banks and state-owned banks uh, in developing countries are capitalized enough to weather the shock? I mean, uh, in the case of a credit default from a state, uh, given that state-owned banks are mostly holders of a public bond, there is a, a high risk, in a way, in developing economies um, that some major systemic banks will fail as well. I'm speaking for countries like Morocco or Tunisia that I know pretty well. Uh, and that have very tight buffers and that haven't necessarily followed the governance and uh, capital regulations, um, um, recommendations that have been done after the global financial crisis. So do you think that the, the banks are capitalized enough and what can we do to avoid a further crisis on that? Thank you very much. I have a last question there. Uh, thank you. It's actually more of a uh, throwing into the discussion a little dimension that wasn't mentioned, and we are in the Arab world, so I would like to throw in the uh, general Arab outlook on growth and inflation. So I'll just be very brief. Uh, the growth rate of the Arab economies is expected to rise in 2022 to record about 5.4% compared to 3.5% in 2021, driven by many factors, most important of which are the relative improvement in global demand levels, the high growth rates of the oil and gas sectors, and the adoption of stimulus packages to support economic recovery by many Arab governments. In line with global development, the general level of prices in Arab countries is expected to rise during 2021. It is expected that during 2022, sorry, the inflation rate in the Arab countries will reach about 7.6% and it's expected to reach about 7.1% in the year 2023. And I'll conclude with this, although some Arab countries are directly affected by the current challenges as they are major importers of food commodities, most Arab countries can play a major role in reducing the global and Arab food gap and achieve self-sufficiency self in some commodities such as wheat and petroleum products. My question is to the, uh, to the panel here or to the gentleman here. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, structural reforms are needed actually to relieve supply constraints and boost productivity and economic capacity? Uh, in order to alleviate the global food crisis, what kind of policy action is required that can help out in that dimension? Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, dear colleagues, I have a tendency to consider that there has, me, there has been so many questions. I counted 11, and I'm sure that there were 12. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> each of us uh, can pick up 
uh, what he would like to uh, comment, uh, it seems to me, as concisely as possible, because then I think that the best to terminate our, uh, our uh, exchange of views is to, to make a new tour de table. And uh, I would, uh, if you agree, I would turn first to Serge and uh, then to Jeff and then to Akinari and so forth. But I, I ask you to be very, very concise, but to pick up really the questions that seems to be uh, exactly in line with what you, you, the message you want to give. Please, Serge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, there's, uh, there's one question that I'd like to answer to. It's naturally re related to the question of the capital. If you remember 2008, uh, the lesson learned uh, 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 back in the days were, to my, to my view, we had two lessons learned. The first one was the need of a tighter regulation the need of a capital increase to increase the buffer. And you remember back in the days, uh, uh, the crisis we were in and you were at the command was that the crisis was worldwide and global. And it was kind of the end of the world. You remember that, right? And I think the two lessons were, one, first question of the, the uh, tighter regulation, the capital increase for the financial industry, and more specifically, for the banks. And we've been through, you know, capital increase in all the different banks. The second lesson learned was the question of the SDR. Remember, it came back on the table, right? So what I think is there's a, there's a kind of, uh, uh, um, there's a kind of uh, 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 symmetry here where we have the same discussions, where I think the, the, the Western banks are well capitalized, even though there's still the question of the capital increase on the table today as we speak. And the second thing, as you're well aware, the question of the SDR uh, um, uh, and the allocation of the SDR, the, uh, uh, the current allocation um, that has been done, that has been made, has been uh, um, uh, um, of no use for the uh, Western countries, of no use at all. And the debate today is how can we reallocate this to those who basically need fundamentally need this SDR. So for me, there's a, there's a symmetry here between the crisis we faced back in the days and the, 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 the crisis we are currently uh, uh, facing with the, two, um, uh, with the two lesson learned I've earlier mentioned. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very, very much indeed. As regards the SDR, uh, when we learn that uh, not a single SDR has been reallocated de facto, it's absolutely terrible. Jeff, you have the floor. I, there's so many questions I, I will try to focus on. Well, one short one and then, then uh, another that I think uh, gets to some of, some of the questions that have been raised, by no means all. First, <clears throat> on the dollar as a reserve currency, um, I think my view is, um, or what I should say is the consensus of experts, which is my view. But the, in fact, the, the, my view is that the, the dollar is going to be the principal reserve currency for the foreseeable future for one obvious reason, which is that there's no obvious, there's no clear replacement. The, the euro is widely used as a reserve currency, um, but it's probably not going to increase much given it, the, its troubled path. And um, the, the renminbi, really is not an international currency in any way, shape, or form, and it's far from having the, the, the Chinese financial markets and <clears throat> Chinese monetary conditions are far from being appropriate for it being adopted by the private sector as a reserve currency. At this point, it's used primarily by uh, central banks that have a connection one way or the other, geopolitically or economically, with, uh, with, with China. So I don't see, you can't beat something with nothing as we sometimes say, and I don't see an obvious alternative to the dollar out there. The dollar is likely to re remain the principal reserve currency for the foreseeable future. That's foreseeable future means, I don't know, maybe the next 10, 15 years. I want, but the main thing I was going to say is about uh, the core issue that some have addressed and that I started with. We could argue for the next many hours about the underlying causes of the current inflation and the appropriate response. But the reality is the really existing economic policy trend is a strong anti-inflationary policy in the OECD. And so, so 
we can debate whether that's the right policy, the right, wrong policy. That's the policy that's being adopted. <clears throat> there's very little question that it's going to continue to be adopted, and there's very little doubt about what its impact is going to be. We're going to face a period of relatively high uh, interest rates and a quite strong dollar. Uh, there may be some fluctuations, and I understand the importance of the volatility. Um, but I think what we should focus on is the impact of the, the truly existing anti-inflationary policy, which is a high interest rate environment, which will bust a lot of bubbles, and a strong dollar. Um, that will lead to, I think, a, a, a series of crises in the emerging markets, those whose debts are denominated in dollars, and for, the, for even those that are not denominated in dollars because the local currency debt interest rates are going to be rising substantially. That's going to create debt servicing problems. Despite what John says, I think, you know, the, the, the debt service has been easy now in low interest environment. The environment is changing dramatically, and so I think the problems are going to surface. They are not going to affect the U.S. directly, but the, the constraints on fiscal policy, and you'll get, you can, you can jump in if you want, but the constraints on fiscal policy are real, and I think in an environment in which there are very, very substantial fiscal needs, like for the energy transition, like for softening the blow of some of these inflation, the anti-inflation policies, governments are going to find their hands tied on the fiscal front in a way that will be politically difficult. Um, and third, there will be distributional effects of these anti-inflationary policies. And these distributional effects, we've seen them already. Um, inflation is not across the board, otherwise we wouldn't worry about it. Inflation is about relative price changes. So it's relative price changes and relative wage or income changes um, will affect very substantial groups of the population, that, and there will be a political backlash. What form it takes, I don't know, whether it will be left-wing populism or right-wing populism or non-populism, but there will be a political backlash. So I think, to me, there are lots of very important issues that people have raised, but there are clear implications of the anti-inflationary policy that the major central banks are going to be pursuing. They have to do with imposing real pressure on the emerging markets, on uh, raising some real questions about the fiscal constraints on, exist on OECD governments and distributional factors that will lead to a political backlash. And those, I think, are the issues that we will face over the coming years. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Jeff. Aki Thank you. Thank you. Let me take up two issues. Uh, the first one is uh, dollar as a reserve currency or the international vehicle currency. I, a uh, hundred percent, not hundred percent, ninety percent agree with Jeff uh, Friedman because of the remaining ten percent, he said the for, foreseeable future, he said 10, 20, 30 years, well, maybe 50 years. Uh, you know, they say, they say give, him a, give him a date or give him a number, but never both at the same time. Right. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, three years ago, I spoke uh, at a plenary session of the international monetary system because uh, it was a time that the BIS published the uh, then latest uh, statistics. And three years passed, and the BIS published a uh, tri so-called triannual uh, exchange market uh, review. Uh, the uh, survey was conducted uh, April of this year. The result was published rather recently. I have uh, statistics here. Uh, it, it's exchange market turnover, and the currency composition total being 200, because it takes two to tango, yeah. right? So uh, US dollar cap continued to capture 88% uh, out of 200, the same as 2019. Euro, 31 from 32, the same, 31, 32. Yen, 17, 17. Uh, sterling, 13 and 13. So as far as major currencies are concerned, I always say that, uh, you know, uh, there has been no big changes, actually, over, the, over many decades. Uh, one notable uh, development was uh, Chinese yuan, uh, renminbi, you may call. It was 4% uh, out of 200, 2019, uh, rose to 7%. Uh, in April 2022. Uh, it was a big increase, although uh, from a very low point. But at the same time, there was a decline one percentage point of, of the shares of Russian ruble, and also one percentage point decline in Hong Kong dollars. Uh, 
and uh, a few other, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, emerging market uh, currencies, uh, yeah. Mexican pesos, a half percentage point declines, something okay. like that. So, in other words, uh, renminbi's uh, rise might be accounted for a substitution for uh, ruble, for obvious reasons, and also Hong Kong dollar for another obvious reasons. Uh, so, this is one, one thing, and and and. And, and uh, this is this is one uh, fact I wanted to uh, say. Uh, another point I wanted to make is about ESG. You know, from a pure e economics theories point of view, um, using uh, financing for um, greening or whatever purposes will distort Pareto optimum. It will be much better to use um, common tax and border adjustment to uh, pre preserve efficient resources, uh, efficient allocation of resources. But it will be much more difficult politically to employ carbon taxes across the board. And, you know, this is uh, <clears throat> only one example. When political decision or, po you know, right political policies are difficult to employ, hmm. politicians ask financing uh, people to do something. Uh, this is, I'm afraid, would uh, <clears throat> this would create another bubble or distortion. Uh, so populism is influences many aspects of a financial world, whether it good or bad. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. My figures for the dollar, the euro, and the other uh, currency is not exactly the same. As regards the reserve assets, we had at the beginning of the euro 70% for the dollar, 20% for the euro, and uh, the number three was the yen, and uh, we had a reserve asset of 5% approximately for the yen. Then the dollar came down over 20 years from 70 to 60%. The euro remained at 20, and uh, the yen was also unchanged. And uh, the 10% that the dollar had lost were in the sterling, in the uh, renminbi, in uh, the Canadian dollar, in the Australian dollar. So there, there has been some kind of redistribution. But it's clear, I have to say that en passant, if there was the political decision to create a European federation overnight, everything changes because the death and, and the liquidity of the, of the treasury market uh, of, of the euro would totally be equivalent to the US. So we, we, we are changing the universe. Uh, it's not very likely <laughs> that we will have a political federation soon. So, uh, Kyung Wok, you have the floor. Uh, I have two comments about the dollar uh as a reserve currency, I agree with the, uh, both of the two previous speakers, but I just want to mention that the more we begin to see uh, dollar as used as a financial weapon through the SWIFT, yeah. I think there will be more incentive to, to find a way to go around it. I don't know when all those incentives got to reach a significant threat in the foreseeable future, probably not, but I just want to point out there just strong incentive, the more we use these weapons, that there will be incentive to, to go around it. The second point, uh, which is not so much an answer, but I just want to raise it, is that because the dollar is so strong and reserve currency, and most of the advanced countries have a standing sub-agreement, but whenever the market becomes very much turbulent, for many uh, countries without all this uh, privilege of a convertible currency, it would be much better for the uh, stability of the global financial market that there is a reasonable expectation that when this uh, Fed will come with some selectively, of course, but sub arrangement to support the system. We, as I said, we have two cases, but we still don't know when this will be mobilized. And that creates a more uncertainty for most of the non convertible currency countries. So I just want to mention it. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much.
I hope one of us will respond to the question on ESG and, uh, and the, uh, uh, I would say, drama that, has, uh, that is associated with this uh, deviation, perhaps, uh, that the finance, uh, global finance is organizing to take advantage uh, of uh, fake ESG. But that's another story. I turn now to uh, Pierre. Um, thank you. Um, let me go back to uh, Bertrand's uh, remark on the allocation of uh, capital. And he said, uh, when are we going to talk about ways to allocate capital properly? Um, I see three uh, responses to that. One is taxes, and what I have in mind is a carbon tax, obviously, and um, I think that uh, we need to restore the, um, the dynamics that would lead to the adoption of a significant carbon tax if we want to be uh, um, consistent with uh, the, um, uh, the talk about transition, energy transition, and climate transition. And by the way, uh, we have been talking about the green transition around this table, but a little bit marginally, because at the same time we are talking about growth. And growth is growth of GDP, and GDP is not uh, a very helpful indicator of, transition, of green transition. So we do have a problem of metrics, and that would be my second, my second approach to it. Which is, we urgently need a metrics to guide the transition because we are in a bizarre world in which in one sentence we mention green transition and the other sentence we call for faster GDP growth. And the two are right now a bit inconsistent. And the third, and that's where I'm still going to be a bit provocative um, uh, with some, uh, some qualification, uh, is in fact budget deficits because what has been done uh, during the COVID period is to uh, direct private savings who, which would have been poorly used and allocated through the government who presumably did a better allocation job. That's debatable, but if the, if the private capital is poorly allocated, then there may be governmental solutions. So that's a way to restore uh, the, uh, uh, the meaning of, of public deficit. Now, I would uh, again uh, mention what uh, Jeff rightly said. We are in a situation in which we have overground budget deficits. So the margin of maneuver is very, very tight, whatever we think about budget deficit. So, but just to mention that we, we should see the allocation of savings as a global, uh, with a global approach rather than always separating public and private, because in the end, this is a bit artificial, right? Well, what counts is the allocation of capital in the economy. And we need, we, we know that the green transition requires a lot of investments. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Pierre. André. I guess that you might have uh, yes. some message to respond to some of the questions, no? On, on ESG. Yeah. On ESG. We, we, we have a work in progress in trying to measure, to, to quantify uh, you know, more scientifically, if, if you wish, some of the elements of ESG and to build a database of you know, controlled numbers which would make it significant. But because of the time being, I fear a backlash on ESG. There's huge amounts of money which is invested on the basis of implied ESG or you know, published ESG with, with usually very, very little substance. So the real point I wanted to make, which is the same question in a different way, the pricing of risk is extremely difficult when you talk about climate because the externalities are huge, both positive and negative externalities. Uh, and they are, you know, and you know, we know all very well that pricing externalities is not very easy. You know, it, it requires regulation, government intervention, and so on. And when you talk about long-term investments, it's even worse. You know, we heard this afternoon, the, the time it takes to, to create new mines, you know, to, to, to change uh, processes in industry, huge amounts of money, long time frame, and huge externalities. Mm. Uh, so, plus the fact that uh, banks have to pay a higher price for risk than non-banks. 
So there will be a shift also of the funding outside of the banks. So we are facing a very, very difficult situation in which uh, I don't see how we can avoid uh, government intervention. You know, I, I, carbon tax is one way to simplify part of the problem. Uh, it's unlikely that it will happen on a global basis. <laughs> but uh, uh, in other words, uh, to go back to what Pierre said, uh, we, externalities mean in some ways government intervention, which mean in some ways deficits. So we're not out of the woods. I would have suggested maybe rules, regulations, global rules, global recommendations. We have created a year ago a new board, which is the International Sustainable Standard Board, ISSB, which is, has very ambitious, has already hubs uh, in Asia, Tokyo and, and uh, Beijing, hubs uh, in Europe with uh, headquarters in Frankfurt, uh, based also in London, based in, uh, in, uh, in Montreal. I mean, they are very ambitious. Uh, every, every country is on board. China is on board. And so I, I don't... We, I don't know whether uh, uh, the specialists are expecting something from this uh, new board, but the international community uh, is betting on this new board, and uh, they have practically completed their, uh, the members, the membership. Uh, so I don't want to elaborate too much on that. I was a little bit involved in the, in the creation, the setting up of that uh, new board. Uh, anyway. Uh, more deficit seems to me absolutely aberrant. So everything has to be financed through savings, savings, savings. In a country which we know very well, André and I, who is spending around 10% more than equivalent countries in public spendings, there are certainly uh, you know, savings to, to make and we could perhaps uh, re reallocate massively. But that's another story. Now, John, a lot of questions for you. Okay, uh, just one, one comment on what you just said. Uh, and that, that strikes me, it, for a long time, <clears throat> the, uh, I remember it, uh, vividly at the April 2009 G20 summit at the ministerial meeting of the G20, the question was raised, should the finance ministers take up the issue of climate finance? And without naming names, there were some strong voices saying, absolutely not. No expertise. This belongs in the, in the UNCCC. This is not for, our, for us. So what you had for a period of time was the formulation of goals that with, with no consideration of the sources of financing. And it strikes me that what, what's happening now finally is these, uh, we're starting to get this, to push this together and get some realism about what can be done. Okay, the, uh, the points uh, that I wanted to make, uh, uh, first, for sure, the outlook for inflation and how difficult it will be to restore low inflation is absolutely critical. And my point was, we went through a decade in which we had lower than expected inflation and even today we don't really have an explanation of why that happened. So we can't be sure because what we're doing now is saying if we look to the past when we tried to get inflation down before it took this, this, and this, and if that happened then, uh, we just can't be, can't be sure. But for sure, if it is difficult to get inflation down, there will be some consequences. And one of the consequences is, uh, as I started out, for the advanced economies, they have gotten away with this big increase in debt because interest rates and debt service have been so low. And if, that, if they're unsuccessful, we're going to have a big problem. Now, I should have been, I should have been more clear. Um, this has not been true for the developing economies or the emerging economies. And in fact, a decade ago, at the, at the end of the, the global financial crisis, debt service burdens or the percentage of public revenues that we required to cover de public debt service in the, in the developing economies was about the same as in the advanced economies. And today it's multiples 
of, of the uh, burden. This is why we know that debt, debt problems are coming for the developing countries, because if anything, it's going to get worse. In their interest rates are going to go higher, and they're, for especially the non, uh, uh, non-resource-rich developing economies, growth is, their income's going to be uh, lower. So something needs to be done. This one is foreseeable. What has to happen? One, we need better standards of debt transparency. And that's going to require cooperation by everybody to put, uh, put the numbers on the table if we're going to come to some kind of an agreement on, debts, on uh, debt restructuring and debt relief for the developing economies. There has to be a, a, an understanding on all sides of where we, where we start. Second problem is private sector engagement. Right now, the, uh, the standard operating procedure is the public sector makes the decisions, turns around to the, uh, e even if we overcome this issue of debt transparency, how the, one of the problems of the common framework, which is a problem of the Paris Club, is the public sector gets together and then dictates to the private sector as to what their role is and engage, that, that produces log jams. Uh, so that we need a better a better form of public of private sector engagement, and cl better clarity on how do you, what is fair burden sharing. At any rate, the, my point here is, we know the problems coming. It's going to be broad and big, and we we need to, to do better. And uh, finally, one one ex slightly extraneous remark on uh, the the. A process of not debt of not of crisis resolution, but crisis prevention, and that involved the Fed swaps to the emerging to the uh, large emerging economies uh, that uh, uh, President Herb was just talking about. Uh, I always considered that um, the Fed's granting of uh, swap lines to uh, a small number of large emerging economies as systemically destructive or dis at least systemically uh, disruptive. Because the question is, uh, right now, the, the system, if there is a system, is in the wake of the global financial crisis, the major central banks created permanent unlimited swap lines among them. Let's call out, those are the guys fly, flying first class. Now, the Fed created business class, the favored friends of the Fed, that under circumstances that are not, not specified in advance, uh, the Fed is willing to supply swap lines to countries in amounts and durations that are, un, that are not, not known in advance, under criteria that are not known in advance. I couldn't see why that was systemically helpful, because the implication is if you're worried about, for example, creating stigma about going to, e.g., the IMF for help, that's a way to make the stigma even worse. If there's going to be crisis prevention in a world of securitized finance, you need insurance-like, swap-like facilities. The IMF should be given swap-like facilities that they could offer to all its members. And I think that would be helpful. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you very much. Jean-Claude? Yes, I would just comment that the emerging countries which we help to finance from time to time in certain countries are facing today, indeed, huge difficulties. They cannot even finance their budget deficit right now. Not only that, but they have problems of defense vis-a-vis -vis the Islamist world, and they cannot, they cannot <laughs> uh, pay the, the, their armies, uh, which is uh, extremely detrimental today. When they have, for instance, Ivory Coast for 10 years, would pay between 8 and 9 percent interest rates. They cannot afford it, which is a problem. Now, I'm sorry, Jean-Claude, but Christine Lagarde uh, uh, confirms my hardcore figure, which is not 4.3 percent, but 4.8 percent for the Eurozone, which is in her speech in Tallinn in November 2nd or 3rd, uh, 4.8 percent. Co-inflation, which excludes, uh, I, has risen 4.8%. As I said, I don't take the ECB figure. I take the statistics figures you're of right. the so euro area. You're right. <laughs> and, uh, no, but I'm sorry, because, because I do the same for the U.S., and they are always a way of uh, 
uh, introducing uh, uh, alcohol and tobacco, and uh, I don't know why. I mean, you, you have this idea that, and I understand why they do that, same in the US because they, they try to avoid the spiraling, the wages yes. and, and prices spiraling. And so the lowest possible, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, core inflation is better from their standpoint, which I fully agree uh, from their standpoint. But I think that what counts is what are the real figures, uh, which are, by the way, very different from country to country also, to complicate the European reading of the situation. As you know, inflation in Fran national inflation in France is much lower than in many other countries because of the cost uh, which is paid by the fiscal uh, uh, in interaction. Uh, the, f the French are uh, spending a lot of money to alleviate the price of oil and gas and so forth. So, but thank you very much, Jean-Claude. We will, we will check uh, bilaterally yes. and with Christine exactly where we stand. Thank you very much indeed. I think that we, we uh, came through many problems. I note en passant that this issue of whether for the dollar or for the euro, it is wise to have sanctions that are freezing the reserve assets is a real, real issue. And I was public to be against those sanctions against the Central Bank of Russia. And I still consider it's absurd we have given the rest of the world the signal that to have dollar or euro as reserve assets is a bad idea. And we call for uh, many countries that are uh, in the rest of the world are not specially sure that at any time they won't have a problem with the US or with the West or whatever. And we told them, look, uh, be careful. You should put your money in other instruments. That, that was a big, big, big mistake and a very bad move. My, my sentiment, my sentiment. A, a second point which I wanted to, to make uh, clear, uh, and again, it's not the dollar, it's uh, the euro also. And the Europeans know how the US can be inward looking we, when we were applying by the rule and by the treaty, the, the accord that we had with Iran and the US Congress decided to punish us because we were implementing what had been decided and signed. That was absolutely infuriating all the Europeans. I mean, there, there is something there. The, the dollar, in a way, is a public good <laughs> at the global level. And, uh, and uh, the New York market is also a public good. So to, to decide that it is the private property of one particular country is, is really self-destroying. I mentioned that. Even the Europeans were really infuriated. The Commission was trying to invent a bypass of the, of the thing, and it didn't work, by the way. So, uh, and, and my last point would be, uh, of course, it is- Joko, can I remind you that 50 years ago, an American Treasury Secretary said, it's our currency, but it's your problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Connolly, Connolly. <laughs> it's our currency, it's your problem. That's true. That's true. Still true. Uh, 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 last point. Uh, we had a very good discussion on the balance for the central banks between uh, considering that the price of uh, some commodities and uh, the, the, I would say, inflation burst uh, is both depressive or recessive and inflationary. And so you have to balance the fact that you have to fight against the, the inflationary aspect, but be very careful that it is also recessive. And there are differences between the US and Europe. It's more recessive in Europe, so that justify a monetary policy significantly different, obviously, and will continue to be significantly different. But in any case, there is a point fix, an Archimedes, Archimedean point, if I may, which is that you must go down in a reasonable time to price stability. Otherwise, you are in a situation of the Fed in the 70s and beginning of the 80s. Then Paul Volcker comes. Inflation is at 14% and sustainable in the long run, if I may. He has to do what is necessary. And what is necessary is much more dramatic than being a little bit ahead of the curve and try to regain control in time. 
because when you have an inflation at 14%, uh, your short-term interest rates are at 19 and 20 at certain moments to regain control, and you trigger a dramatic recession and a dramatic financial crisis. Uh, nothing to, to be compared to what we expect will happen, taking into account that the central bank are not... Uh, nonchalant, and they are not saying, okay, no problem, we don't, uh, we don't move because the recessionary impact of what's happening is sufficient to correct the trajectory. But if, if, when they do that, when they do nothing, all the second round effects are uh, uh, materializing and, and the situation becomes really very dramatic. So it's a, I, I understand that there is a balance to be found and it's normal that academia is reflecting permanently and on the impact, of course, on the social fabric and the political social fabric of what, what is being done. But, but, but it's very serious stuff. And, uh, and I am reassured that both central banks and all central banks, uh, to, to be frank, of the advanced economy, had said we, have, we are trying to anchor expectations 2% in three years' time is something which is reasonable and it is what we will try to deliver. This is reassuring because, and also because it's the same goal, not the same monetary policy, not the same situation, but the same goal. I think that to, uh, the audience could applaud perhaps uh, the, <laughs> the speakers. <laughs> Thank you indeed.